Hey Metro, this week you're gonna be looking at growing into an emotionally mature adult and the Good Samaritan. Uh, again, this, this week is meant to put feet on that great commandment to love well. And it's not just knowing it in your head, it's actually doing it practically. And so this becoming an adult out of being an emotional infant or child or adolescent, friends, is one of the keys if we're gonna be a blessing and a gift to the world. So uh, enjoy. Welcome. Welcome to all that are here. Welcome to our online community, those watching in the nursery. And uh, we continue in this series on emotionally healthy spirituality. You've been with us from the beginning. Uh, I think this has been a real deep series where we've been confronted to take a deep, hard look at some of the things in our own life. And today is no different. When I first met my wife, I met her in college. I was a freshman year in college. And somehow, some way, uh, I started to fall in love with her. It was like one of these weird moments. It was like a TV drama. And she just walked through the doorway. And I knew her before, but somehow she had a haircut and she just looked different and everything was in slow motion. She started to shake her head and just her hair looked so beautiful and I just fell in love with her. Somehow, I, I was so scared to admit my feelings for her, but somehow we would eat together a lot and, and secretly we just would kind of hold hands underneath the table and without really confessing our feelings. And, and we do that. And I remember just like once I was looking at her hand, and it looked so beautiful. And I looked at the pattern of her veins, and it, and it literally spelled, I love you. And I was like, wow, she really loves me. And so it was one of those great moments. And then I proposed to her, and I said, let's get married. And man, I dreamed about being with this woman for the rest of my life. And I just dreamed that loving her would be so easy, that it wouldn't even be that difficult. And so I was excited about doing this and, and entering into marriage with her. And then we got married on September of 1999. And it's been 17 years. And I still remember that first year of our marriage. It was so difficult. We had never fought like that. We had fought before, but we've always been able to sleep in separate beds before. But now we actually had to live together and deal with our issues. And it was so hard and so painful. A lot of it, I'd try to bring God into the picture and try to force her to change on a spiritual level. And really what I was doing was I was spiritually manipulating her. And it was so painful and so hard during those times. And I realized something that was so true, that it's so easy to dream about loving someone but when you put it into practice, it's altogether different, isn't it? It's a lot harder. In fact, I would say it becomes a dreadful reality. You see, for many of you, you've fallen in love with the idea of dreaming of loving people. Many of you got married to the person that you're next to today because you dreamed about loving them. But to put it into practice is actually a dreadful reality because it's a lot harder to love somebody. But yet that's the essence of what it means to be a follower of God. Because Jesus Christ wants you to be a great lover, to love people, right? And part of the reason why that's such a central thought or a central part of the gospel message is because we affirm God's image that he created us with. That when you are able to love your neighbor and when you're able to love people in a real healthy way, you affirm God creating you in his image, amen? And so that's why it cannot be a non-negotiable. For many of us, we think that it's an option that you can love some and you can't love and you don't have to love other people. But really, when you look at it in the Bible, you'll find that it's a non-negotiable that you and I must learn to love other people, especially those that rub us the wrong way. That is a true mark of a Christian follower of Jesus Christ. And so today I want to talk to you about what an emotionally mature adult looks like. I'm going to ask you, are you still an infant are you a child? Are you an adolescent? Or are you actually an emotional adult? How you answer that truthfully will begin, I believe, the process of you being able to maturate into an emotionally mature adult. Because if we don't do that, then you will continue to live your life with a sense of superficiality. The pull to live a superficial life in our culture is so strong that for many of you, you are faking it and you don't even know that you're doing it because it's become so much of who you are. It should be your foe, but it's become your friend. And for some of you, because you've pretended all your life, you don't even know how to be real. You have no idea how to be that person. And you're lost. And today, I believe God's gonna teach us how we can do that. Aren't you tired of being jealous? I am. Aren't you tired of faking it and pretending everything's okay when deep down it's not? Aren't you tired 
of pretending your kids are so great when you realize they really aren't. But with people outside, you boast about them like they're the greatest things in the world. But you know the true story. Aren't you tired of just kind of existing and not really living the life that you want to live? You get sad when you get old and you feel like maybe life is not as good as you want to. Aren't you tired of hitting a midlife crisis every single year of your life? It's a real difficult path that I think some of us have chosen to live today. And I think chronologically we mature into the age that we look. Right? So whatever age you are, I think you kind of look like that. No offense. I mean, some of you actually look younger, which is great. Give or take a couple years. I think we mature chronologically to the age of whatever we are. But emotionally, the truth is, whether you're 50, 60, 70, or 30, you could be a two-year-old. Because I don't think no one's ever taught us how to become an emotionally mature adult. And so today we're going to look at one of the most famous passages of, of Scripture the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in this passage, we're going to learn how we can begin this journey of becoming an emotionally mature adult. Now, it's nothing new. In the past several weeks of, of what we've talked about, it's all leading up to this one moment. All right, we're almost done with the series. But now it's the part of let's become an emotionally mature adult. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Luke chapter 10. And we're going to look at verse 25 and following. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 and following. Here's what it says. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Now, he was very happy that he answered the right question. But he wanted Jesus to say, you the man. You're doing it. You're loving your neighbor. So what is, how does he do it? He doesn't say, hey, can you affirm me? He, he says this. He says, who's my neighbor? And he was hoping to get that answer of Jesus saying, well, here's who your neighbor is, and you're doing a great job at it. You ever, like, you know, try to get somebody to affirm you, but you don't want to actually say, hey, would you affirm me? Because that would be kind of inappropriate. But you want them. Like, you bench 300 pounds, and you want to tell people, and people will be like, wow, you bench 300 pounds? But you got to sort of think creatively of saying, you know, hey, I've done something so great. But you say, hey, how much you bench? You'll say something, I'll bench 150, 200. Oh, okay. And then somehow you're hoping that they'll say, well, how about you? And you say, oh, I'm glad you asked. 300. (laughs) Wow, 300 pounds? Amazing. And that's what he was hoping to get a reaction from Jesus. Wow, you are loving your neighbor. But this is what Jesus does. He throws him a crazy curveball. He says in verse 30, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. So God, we come to you at this moment, and we ask you, Lord, that you would help us to unpack this passage. But most of all, God, I pray that you would challenge us and that we would see the necessity, God, of of changing our lives if we have to so that we can become more emotionally mature adults. And God, that we would stop fighting the battles and the insecurities that we've been facing since we were a child. But, God, that we would be able to take great strides and steps today to becoming an emotionally mature adult. And so I pray that the words that come out of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts in this room, I pray, God, that it will be pleasing unto you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. And so what Jesus is doing here is really interesting because what he's doing, he's saying that loving God and loving our neighbor are not separate. They're inseparable. That they have to be connected together, meaning Your love for God is often a reflection of your ability to love other people. 
All right? You can't separate those things. But for many of us, we've dichotomized it, haven't we? That we can actually come and say that we're a follower of Christ, or we can actually lead worship, or we can lead a Bible study. We think we're doing a good thing because we say we love God, but yet we don't even think about that how we are treating people who rubbed us the wrong way, or maybe not loving them or being forgiving towards them. We completely negate the fact that they're doing something bad to us, and so then maybe we pour out sort of a wrath on them, or we don't love on them the way God wants us to. And we think it's completely okay to continue to go on and saying that we're a follower of Jesus and we love God, yet while we're hating our neighbor. Jesus says that you really can't separate the two, that you're not loving God if you're not loving your neighbor. And that's the statement that he's trying to make. And so what we need to realize is this, is that when you want to become a Christian, it's a great thing because the Bible teaches us that we are, what, a new creation, doesn't it? It says that we are a new creation and the old has gone and the new has come. When that passage is stated in 2 Corinthians by Paul, it's not to say that just because you're this new creation that everything is going to be okay. That's not what it is. It's saying that you are to live like this new creation. That Jesus Christ has come and he's created this position before you so that now you can go before God. And when you go before him, you are a forgiven, loved God pouring out his mercy upon your life. That's the position in which God has created before you, which is a position that you and I should always be thankful for and celebrate. Amen? We have to celebrate that. But you still got to live like that. You got to live like that new creation. Oftentimes, the old will also often come back. When I became a Christian, I became a Christian in 1989. I was a sophomore in high school. I was in 10th grade, and uh, I, I, uh, I went to this, we call them revival meetings back in the day. And I went to a revival meeting, and it was just for youth group kids. And so I went with my church that I kind of attended. And I went primarily, if I'm going to be very honest with you, I went with the hopes of potentially meeting a girl. That's why I went. I was a hopeless romantic, meaning I wanted a girlfriend, I wanted to be in a relationship, but I had zero game, all right? I didn't know how to get a girlfriend, but I wanted one so bad. So I, was, I got dressed up, I tried to look as best as I could. I was hoping at least maybe I can get a phone number or perhaps maybe a, a smile, that would be enough for me, right? And so I go there and to my shock, I come to experience Jesus Christ for the very first time. And it was a massive conversion experience, I really believed. And I just thought everything naturally is going to be okay. Because the foundation of my life was very shaky. I was a very insecure person because I grew up in an abusive, physically abusive home. When you grow up in a physically abusive home, you really struggle with self-worth and self-esteem. I just thought as I became a Christian that everything was going to be okay. And, and I believed it, and I found that it really wasn't. And when I was in youth group, I, I, uh, years later, I became the president of my youth group was the worship leader, felt really spiritual. Kind of had a feelings for this one girl that attended my youth group, really liked her, but again, didn't know how to admit my feelings for her. So I just kind of let it drag on, drag on, drag on. And all of a sudden, this dude started coming to our church from Queens. He had no business coming to our church. <laughs> all right? Two bridges away. He had a car. He drove. All right? Made me sick to my stomach. He started coming, and this guy was real smart, and she really liked the smart dudes, and I wasn't that kind of person. And so she just was really taken by him. And I remember this guy, and his name was Jay. There's no reason for me to hate him, but I wanted to kill him. <laughs> I wanted bad things to happen to him. I did not want him to come to church anymore because he was my enemy. He was going to take the girl that I really had feelings for. I realized just because I said I'm a Christian and I love Jesus, I still related to people at that emotional level the, the same. I realized how far I was away from this. And back then as a kid, you don't know. You don't know these things. You have no idea. But then as you get older and you start to think about these things, you realize how unhealthy you really are. And you see, you are this new creation before God. You are this new creation, but yet still within you is generational sins and patterns that have been passed down from generation to generation. And no matter how much you are trying to live out this new creation and trying to live out what the Bible tells you to do it, in your bloodstream is the way your parents always did it. In your bloodstream is the way your grandparents did things. So you relate to people the way your parents related towards one another. You relate to people how your grandparents related to one another. And you realize that it's very difficult for you to try to live out this new creation life in which God has given to you. And so the challenge is how do you break out of being a slave for 400 years in Egypt? 
How do you do that? You know, the people of God had to be in the wilderness for 40 years because they needed to know what it was like to now be the people of God. That even though they were in the wilderness and they were in this place of discipleship and training to learn how to differentiate themselves from being the slave for 400 years, that they many times they just said, let's just go back. Let's go back to Egypt. This is too hard. And for many of us, you know what this new creation is about. You know what you should be. And for many of us, it's just a matter of us just saying, let's just go back to the old way. Let's just go back to me being who I am because this new creation thing is way too difficult for me. Physically, you have no issues maturing as long as you're eating food. Intellectually, your parents have invested thousands upon thousands of dollars in your intellectual capacities for you to thrive and be where you are today. You have no problems growing intellectually. But emotionally, for many of you, you're at a remedial level because you didn't have anyone to help you through this, especially if you came from immigrant families from this country and you're like a second generation or 1.5 generation, whatever you are, Korean, Chinese, you know, uh, 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 Indian or whatever you are. Because as immigrants, your parents didn't have the ability to attend to you on an emotional level because they had to work and try to put food on the table. And so you grew up in homes where this wasn't there. It wasn't ready for you. It wasn't available for you. And that's why when you look at Christians today in the church, we love probably the same of people that are outside the church. Maybe even worse. Now, I know the statistics, recent statistics say that when you look at marriages in the church, they actually are better than the marriages outside when they look at the rates of divorce. So in the past, there were statistics that said 50% of all marriages ends in a divorce and 50% of all marriages outside the church end up in a divorce. Well, now they find that it's actually a lot higher for outside the church and lower for inside the church. But I'm telling you right now, our marriages are just as screwed up as the marriages outside the church. For some of you, your enemy is your spouse. You hate them because of how much rejection you feel like they give to you on a normal basis. You want to be like a human. You want to be an adult, but they still treat you like a little kid. For some of you, these are some of the hardest people to love is the one that you've married, and now you don't know how to get out of it, and you don't know how to make sense and how to say, how do I make this better? How do I make this relationship better? Because we were never given the tools growing up to grow and to learn and to connect on a deep emotional life. And so I need to ask yourself, where are you today? Are you an emotional infant? Are you an emotional child? Or are you an emotional adolescent? Are you actually an emotional adult? The goal is for us to become an adult, all right? Let's, let's look at these just specifically for a little bit. I want you to think of a chronological infant. Now, we have a ton of babies in this church and nursery parents. I know you can relate to this. When your baby is crying, they can't communicate. They can't say, hey, mom, dad, I'm kind of hungry right now. Can you give me some food? right? They can't communicate that with you. So what do they do? They cry, right? Mom and dad, my diaper is really dirty right now. I could use a little change. They can't do that. I'm really tired. I really need a nap right now, mom and dad. They cannot do that. So they'll throw a temper tantrum. And if you can't figure out what's going on with them, they'll just continue to whine and cry, right? That really is what happens when you have an infant and you're caring for an infant. And because they're an infant, it's okay. But for many of us, we're emotional infants. And you know what emotional infants often do? They act like tyrants, and they don't know how to speak up. They don't know how to share. They don't know how to communicate what they're going through. Oftentimes, what they often do is that when they get into an argument with you, they win through intimidation. You like to win arguments by intimidating the people that oftentimes you love the most or the people that you're fighting with. But that's an emotional infant. An emotional infant doesn't have the capacity to empathize with other people. And so as a result, they only care about themselves, and they only care about winning. That's an emotional infant. Winning every argument that they have with people. They care about those things. That is an emotional infant, okay? Now, I know it's nobody in this room, so don't worry about it. Emotional, how about a chronological child? When a child is 5, 8, 10 years old, yes, they can communicate, but they still don't know how to communicate properly what they're going through. So what happens is that they'll act out more than they feel. So say your son, um, a, a friend didn't pick him up at the soccer game. He'll come home and rather than saying, Mom, Dad, I'm really upset that today that Tom didn't pick me up at the soccer game. He'll come home and rather than telling you that, he'll start throwing temper tantrums. He'll start throwing his toys. He'll start yelling, start smacking his sisters. And you're like, what's going on with you? He doesn't know how to deal with it. He doesn't know how to communicate. He just acts out his anger 
and his frustrations. All right. Now, an emotional child is still similar to that. When they get upset at someone, you know how they act? They distance themselves. They're silent with that person that they don't like very much. They pout. They whine. They gossip. They often do that many times. They don't know how to openly and honestly express their needs because they're functioning at such a low level and they don't know how to express what they're feeling. And so they separate themselves oftentimes. One of the things that my kids and I have been doing for the past six years, and I highly encourage you parents, if you have young ones, to start doing this. We go around the dinner table and we share what made us happy and what made us sad. It's a great drill because it helps your kids to sort of get into this place where they can start sharing their emotions with you. And so, you know, in the beginning, I think it was very hard for my kids to kind of grab onto it, especially to share what made them sad. And so, like, my wife and I had to really be the example. And so we had to share really openly what made us sad. And sometimes if we were angry at each other, like, my wife would just share very openly, like, all the things I did wrong to her, <laughs> to my kids. I'd be like, TMI, honey, stop it. It's too much information. But she's like, you want me to set the tone? And so we do that. And so in the beginning, it was very difficult for our kids. And I still remember Christian in the, in the beginning, it was, he would just share like, you know, what made me sad, what, what made me happy. It would just be like, I had a good time at school. Gym was awesome. You know, what made me sad? Uh, we're eating spaghetti tonight. No, it would be like that. But then he was able to dig deeper. And there was one time we went around and he couldn't speak what made him sad. He was just quiet, and we knew there was something that he wanted to share. And again, he's the youngest, so we just waited patiently before we ate, and we said, what's going on? What happened? And then he was openly able to share that there's a kid in school that actually hits him, and he gets bullied, and he starts crying at the dinner table. It was just a beautiful practice where my wife and I were able to come around and support him and help him to fight his own battles rather than saying, all right, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to talk to that teacher. I'm going to talk to that principal. I'm going to take care of this. But we just said, here's what you should do. We gave him the tools to be able to deal with this and the support that he needed. We have to do that for our children. All right? An emotional infant, an emotional child, an emotional adolescent. What's an, who's an emotional adolescent? An emotional adolescent are people that are often very defensive. You can't handle criticism. You hate it. Because you feel like a criticism is like a blow to your self-esteem and your self-worth. Rather than taking responsibility for some of your actions, you constantly blame the other person. You're judgmental and you're quite self-centered. Is that you? An infant, a child, an adolescent, emotionally, are people that are only capable, you're the, you can only love people who love you back. And that's even conditional. Because once they stop loving you back, then you stop loving them back. Now, emotional adult is very different. An emotional adult is somebody who's able to ask for what they need, what they want, and what they prefer. They can do it really clearly and directly and respectfully and honestly with you. An emotional adult is not concerned about winning an argument. They're not concerned about that. They're actually concerned more about how can we both win rather than one win and one lose. An emotional, mature adult is able to love somebody who actually hates on them. Why? Because they lean on understanding. They're asking the question, how can I better understand the brokenness of my husband, the brokenness of my wife, the brokenness of my mother-in-law, the brokenness of my dad or my sister or my cousin? How can I lean on the understanding of their brokenness so that I can learn to love them better? Not just, you know, uh, condone what they've done to me. It's not to make what they did right, but it's to get to the place where you understand their brokenness so that you can love them. And that, I've said this many times. God loves you. Why? Because he understands your brokenness. If he didn't understand your brokenness, he would kill you. But because he understands the depth of our brokenness... He loves us so much because he understands. And we are called to do the same. That we're called to under, try to lean on the understanding of somebody's brokenness who've tried to hurt us. All right? Emotionally mature adults see this pathway of growing and loving people. They don't try to do it. They train themselves to do it. And that's the key thing here. A lot of us, we like to try. 
But it's, this is not about trying. To become an emotionally mature adult, you have to learn to train yourself. Because if you're not going to be convinced that you're going to train yourself, then you have no hope. And when you look at the story of the Good Samaritan, you'll find that the Good Samaritan was somebody who's trained himself to be an emotionally mature adult. When you juxtapose him with this, with this Levite and the priest, you'll find that they're not emotionally mature. Because here is this man that was mugged from Jerusalem to Jericho. That road was about 18 miles long. And what you find is that a very, it was a very steep, dark road. And many robbers and, and people who didn't want to, who wanted to mug people would hide underneath the caves in that road. And what would happen was is that at night they would come out as people were walking and they would mug them they, and they would take their money and hurt them. And that's what happened. This man came. And when you find is that this Levite and this priest, and we can guess and we can surmise that this man who was beaten down was Jewish because he was coming from Jerusalem to Jericho. And so that he was Jewish, and they see this man literally half dead. And what do they do? Without even a moment's thought, they just walk to the other side and they walk away. Not even a moment of thought, should I help, should I not? They just walk by. Why? Why do they do that? Why? Some scholars say it's because they were busy. They had to go to the synagogue. They had to lead a service. Busyness is one of the killers of emotionally healthy spirituality. Busyness, I believe, is a killer to becoming spiritually healthy. Other scholars say that it's because they didn't want to become unclean. Because if they touched somebody with all that blood, and if he was dead, they would be ceremoniously unclean. And they would have to go through that ritual of becoming clean. And so as a result, they just pulled away. Some others said that they were just afraid that maybe they would get mugged. That could be a great setup. That as there's a guy there lying dead, there's other robbers waiting to jump them. And so they walk to the other side of the road. And what you need to know is that all these answers, these speculations of why these, the priest and the Levite did this was because they just cared about themselves. That's it. They didn't care about anyone else. It was just about themselves. And that's the problem. An emotionally mature adult, they don't live their lives just thinking about themselves. They actually have the capacity to think about other people. All right? And so I love the story here because what, what Jesus does now is that he chooses a Samaritan. And if you know something about the, the relationship between a Jewish person and a Samaritan person, you realize that it's not very good. They hate each other. In fact, there's such adversaries that Jewish people would say that if you eat with a, fair, with a Samaritan, you're actually eating the flesh of a pig. That's how bad their relationship was. A Samaritan were half-breeds, half-Jewish, half-Gentile. And so as a result of it, they believed they were God's chosen people. And they proclaimed it to the Jewish people. And, of course, that didn't make the Jewish folks very happy. And so they had this deep sense of animosity towards one another. And Jesus uses the Samaritan to be the neighbor in the story. So what is he saying here? Who is your neighbor? Your neighbor isn't someone who's just like you. Your neighbor isn't somebody who you get along well with. Your neighbor is somebody that is so different from you, somebody that you even consider to be your enemy. That's your neighbor. And Jesus says, if you want to love God, you got to love that neighbor as yourself. How do you like them apples? That's pretty hard, isn't it? But think about somebody you hate today. Come on, I know you have a couple. Think about somebody you hate today. And Jesus says, you got to love your neighbor as yourself. you got to love that person. If you don't, you're not loving God. That's tough. The Samaritan had pity, it says. And that word in the Greek is the same word as compassion. He had a deep sense of compassion for this man. And you and I need a deep sense of passion, compassion for others as well. But it's only when we are in a place of health where we can actually take pity on someone else. After Jesus shares that parable, he says, who was the neighbor in the story? And the expert in the law, who's basically a pastor, just says, well, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. And some of you are saying, but Peter, I can't. I can't love those people that I hate today. I just can't. Because the wound is hard. And listen, it's going to be, for some of you, it's a process. Because the abuse that you've had to endure is so deep that it's going to take time, but you got to be on that road to growing in that place. Because if you don't, then the alternative is you become a prisoner of your past. And you give those people in your life way too much authority, and they will destroy the quality of your life in the present and in the future. That's why you have to go through this. That's why you have to walk and uh, mature and match right through this. So the, the only way you're going to be able to do it, though, is that in the story of the parable of the Good Samaritan, you have to realize that you were that person on the ground half dead. And that Jesus came and he was your good Samaritan and he saved you. 
You have to see yourself as the person who was dead and lying on that floor. And Jesus, in his love, in his compassion, in his mercy, comes and he delivers you in a beautiful way. And once you realize that, once you realize that in your brokenness, in your sin, like these beautiful boys said, you know, I realized how much I sinned against God. And they realized that in that, even in the midst of that, that God had forgiven them, then you can forgive those who've hurt you. You've experienced that grace from God. And so as a result, you're able to forgive those who've hurt you. Amen? Amen. I love, I got to just stop and say this, but I love this good Samaritan because he's got a healthy mercy. He doesn't have a dysfunctional mercy. What's the, what's the difference between a healthy mercy and dysfunctional mercy? It's really what you see in the Good Samaritan because he sees him and he bandages him up. He takes care of him. He doesn't walk out. But then he takes him to an inn. He doesn't bring him home to mom or to his wife. He says, honey, guess what? We have a visitor and you got to be with him day in, day night and take care of him. No, he brings him to an inn. He pays the innkeeper and says, take care of him. I'll be back in a few days. That's a healthy mercy. For some of you, you struggle with the Messiah complex. For some of you, you love being the Savior. It means so much to you that, that you feel so good about yourself that you can save somebody, and that's wrong. That's idolatry. you got to have a healthy sense of mercy, and when you become an emotionally mature adult, you'll know how to have those boundaries. This man knew that he just had to love one person at a time, that he had to go and save the whole world, but that God is using him to love just one person, a healthy, healthy mercy. So how do we grow into a healthy, mature adult? How do we do that? The first thing that you and I have to do is this, that in order for us to become an emotionally mature adult, we have to become aware of our family of origins capacity for emotional connection. You have to become aware of your family of origins capacity for emotional connection. You're saying, what in the world does that mean? You know what it means? Here it is. Growing up as a child. Did you grow up in an emotionally secure environment? Was your home a safe place for you? to process the things that you were going through emotionally. Did your parents give you space to go through that? I'm not saying a time when maybe you were sick and they they stood by you and they helped you get better. I'm talking about a deep time in your life. Did you have moments in your life where your parents supported you and said, what's going on? What's wrong with you? Are you okay? When you brought home a C and you were sad that you brought home a C because you tried really hard, did your parents say, hey, you tried your best. I'm proud of you. Try better next time. Or did they yell at you and say, why didn't you bring home an A? And they hurt you in a deep way. But you couldn't share that because all they just want from you is excellence. They see you as a doer than just somebody that they can love and care for. Did you get bullied in school, but yet you knew that you, that wasn't the place for you to share with your parents? I, uh, I was bullied a lot in school. And I was bullied just because I was Korean. That was the only reason why I was bullied. And there's this one guy in school, he always bullied me, and he loved bullying me. His name was Anthony Spinopoulos. I'll never forget his name. I actually tried to look on Facebook for him because I wanted to show you a picture of him, uh, but I couldn't find him. I really couldn't. Um, Anthony Spinopoulos, he was Greek. He looked like a Greek god. All right? He looked like Zeus. He always wore a tight Metallica T-shirt. Very short. His arms were bulging. He had veins popping all over. And he would just kind of like look at me and go, after school, I'm going to fight you. And he would just flex. <laughs> he would always say, like, during the mornings, you know, like, before, like, during school. And that whole day, I'd sit in class, all my classes. I was, like, in sixth grade. And I couldn't pay attention to what the teacher was saying. I just really believed that today was the last day of my life. <laughs> that this guy was going to kill me. And so I thought, what could I do to dodge him? Because I know he's going to wait for me right in the schoolyard. And so a lot of times, I would stay late at school. Sometimes I'd get in trouble. So you know how when you get in trouble, they say after school, detention. I love detention when I got bullied. (laughs) I'd figure out a way to go out through another door, and I'd walk to some obscure route to get home. This guy scared the living daylights out of me, and I knew my parents wouldn't do anything about it. So I never shared it. I didn't have a home where I could do that. Guys, if you grew up in a home where it was not emotionally secure for you, that impacts who you are today. And here's the thing, the sad reality. You can't love people well. 
And that's a truth you have to embrace today about yourself. You literally have to say, my name is Peter Ahn. I didn't grow up in an emotionally healthy environment, safe environment, and as a result, I don't love well. You have to let that truth sit in. Because if you do, then you can, grow, then you can start growing. But until you admit that, rather than denying your upbringing and the kind of home you lived in, you're never going to heal. You're not going to be able to grow from it. you got to ask yourself, did I have an environment where my parents let it, allowed me to feel safe when I was going through emotional pain and hurts? Was I able to cry when my mom and dad got a divorce? Would they tell me to stop it? And for some of you, you lost a parent. Were you able to grieve and cry that you lost a parent? Or did your pastor tell you not to do it because your parent's in heaven? Were you able to grieve some serious losses in your life? Or did you hold it all in and you bottled it in? And all of a sudden now you're married or you're in a relationship right now. And it's so hard for you to love this person. And your spouse is dying because they're wondering, what is going on with this person? you got to embrace the truth that you grew up in an emotionally unsecure environment. And as a result of that, it's preventing you from loving well today. That would be the best thing you can do for yourself today. Is this resonating with any of you? Because if you don't embrace that truth about yourself, you're never going to experience healing. And it's okay. It's not about you bashing your parents because your parents did the best with what they had. But it's about you embracing the truth of your environment in which you grew up. Because once you can do that, then you can face the realities of what you need to do now. And you can stop hiding around your spirituality and stop faking things and stop pretending everything is okay. Just because you're wealthy and you have money, it doesn't mean you have it all together. All right? You have to be able to be honest and real about this stuff. Because if you can't, you're never going to be able to get to a place in your life where you can be reflective and aware of some of the things that you're struggling with today. Did your parents ever teach you the proper balance between dependence and interdependence and independence? Did they ever teach you the proper balance between that? Because many of us don't even know what that is. If you've never been loved well growing up, it's almost impossible for you to love well as an adult. But you can get there, but you got to embrace that truth today. Did you live in an emotionally secure environment growing up? All right? That's the first step. Second and last, and then I'm done, is you got to ask yourself, or you got to give yourself the freedom to process every emotion in the past and present. If you want to become an emotionally mature adult, you got to give yourself the freedom to process every emotion in the past and present. The only way you're going to mature is if you could begin to give yourself a season to grieve. you got to grieve. This Samaritan, I'm sure, became an emotionally mature person because he was able to grieve. He gave himself the freedom to process all of his emotions. How do I know that? Because he had pity on the guy. He knew what it feels like to feel like pain and, and feel like you're literally dying on the floor. He might have experienced something like that in his own life. He had pity. He was able to process those emotions. The Levi and the priest, nothing. Because emotionally, they couldn't connect with the pain of a man who was almost dead on the ground, right? Now, you got to be careful here because some of you then, you take this as a license for you to feel all of your emotions. And the problem with many of us is that you take those feelings then and you give yourself the authority to hurt and destroy other people. That's wrong. You, that's giving your feelings way too much authority than you need to. you got to give yourself the freedom to feel so that you can heal. That's the goal. But I find that there's some people where you are just so feeling everything, and then you start judging and you start hurting other people and becoming a source of a problem and really helping the process out in your life. But you got to give yourself the ability to feel. To process those things. you got to give yourself an opportunity to grieve when you need to grieve. Listen, I'm really excited about our small groups, our underground groups for the next phase. After Easter, uh, we're going to be doing emotionally healthy relationships. It's called Skills 2.0. And it's going to help you to grow and give you tangible tools of how do we start to develop deeper, intimate, healthy relationships with people. And so it's intense. I'm going to be honest. It's going to be intense. But it's going to help you to grow emotionally and to have emotionally healthy relations. I'm excited about that because you cannot do this alone. 
You cannot just say, I'm going to give myself the freedom to feel and process all these emotions and do it in isolation. You can't do it because it's going to be dangerous because I promise you it will hurt. It will be difficult. It's not going to be easy. But if you surround yourself with some people that you can go through with this, then it will be an opportunity for you to grow and experience healing. If you don't have a soulmate, get a soulmate. And start sharing this stuff with your soulmate. I encourage you, maybe this week, maybe you need to meet with a spiritual leader or one of, our, one of us on staff and say, you know what, can I just meet with you? Because there's some things I'd like to talk to you about. For some of you, you might have to hire a counselor and say, can you work with me? Because right now, I'm a mess. Right now, I care too much about what other people think of me. And so I'm putting so much pressure on myself, on my kids, and it's destroying everything in my life. My wife, you name it. And so maybe you need to go and hire a counselor so they can help you process some of this stuff. Whatever it is, understand this. Jesus says, when two or more are gathered in my name, I will be there. So do this in community and know that the Holy Spirit's got you. And it's going to be fearful. It's going to be difficult. But if you embrace it, there could be true healing from it. And you might be amazed how you'll begin to look at some of the painful things in your past and how it won't have the kind of death toll that it has in your life, but you'll be amazed at how it could bring you life now. You see, Jesus cannot change the historical facts of your past, but he can certainly change how you feel about it. Jesus cannot change the factual events of your past, but he can certainly change how you feel about it. The alternative of not doing this, Metro Community Church, is you will be a prisoner of your past, and you will be alone for the rest of your life. You could be married, you could have kids, but you will still feel utterly alone because you are not allowing your true self to come out and heal in a proper way. And if you don't allow yourself to do that, then you won't be able to be loved because I know all of you long for that because in order to be loved, you got to be able to love well as well. Well, this Wednesday, I turned 42 years old, getting old. <laughs> Who whistled? <laughs> so I was, I was working out at the gym this week, and um, one of the girls, because she's a Facebook friend of mine, she just said, hey, happy birthday, Peter. And I said, oh, yeah, thank you. She said, how old are you? And I said, I'm 42. And she said, whoa, I'm sorry. <laughs> I said, no, no. I said, don't apologize. It's okay. I said to her, I said, you know what? I actually really enjoy the aging process. I love getting older. And she looked at me. She goes, what are you talking about? I said, I love it. I said, I just, as I'm getting older, I said, I feel like I'm more free in who I am. Uh, emotionally, I'm healthier. It's like physically, I even feel healthier. I just love getting older. And she just kind of walked away just baffled by what I just shared. But I do. I love the aging process. It's wonderful. It really is. It's overrated to be young, in my opinion. You can't pay me enough money to go back to my 20s. I'm serious. I would never want to go back to my 20s. Some of you would like sign up for it in a heartbeat. Not me. I was a wreck at 20. My 20s and my early 30s, I mean, I was just this emotional wreck. One of my greatest issues was is this. I needed you to love me no matter what. I needed you to like me no matter what. And so in order for me to get that from you, I had to be overly kind and nice and understanding. You could beat me down and hurt me in many ways, but because I longed for that kind of acceptance, because I didn't have a strong foundation, I wasn't secure in who I was as a person. So because of that, I longed for your approval, and so I lived my life for that. I was extremely kind to everyone. I was overly nice. And when I started this church at age 29, I felt like I had stuff to prove that I had to be a good pastor. And, of course, I said, you know, I, I, uh, I want God to use this church to lead a lot of people to Jesus Christ. So, you know, God's going to use us. We'll be a big church. We're doing it for God. But in all honesty, it wasn't for God. It was for me. So I could feel good about myself, feel like I'm worthy enough. Because it wasn't good enough for me to just be okay with the fact that I'm just a child of God. That wasn't good enough for me. I needed the approval of other people. I needed the applause of other people. And the people who really, there's only a few people that knew who I truly was. And that was my parents. But the one who really knew me was Jenny, my wife, my girlfriend at the time. She saw sides of me that no one saw. Because I was this insecure person, I was a jealous boyfriend. Oh, I was jealous. 
always thought that she would leave me for some other guy. And then when she graduated, she was a year older than me, so she graduated before me. And then she worked for LG. I was like, I was in crisis mode. It's a lot of Korean dudes in that company. <laughs> They're a lot smarter, wealthier than me. I was like, I just have no chance. I just believed that she was looking for a way out because I wasn't good. And so I'd make her life miserable. I call at work. I call at night. If she didn't pick up by eight, I realized she probably went out with some of the coworkers <laughs> to the karaoke machine, to karaoke places to drink. I mean, just horrible stuff. Nothing that I'm proud of, ashamed of. I would never go back to my 20s. My wife right now is in Cancun, Mexico, partying with her friends. <laughs> and it feels so good to say, honey, have a great time. Party all you want. I know you'll do it responsibly. And I don't have to worry and call her and be like, oh, what's going on? I remember when I first started this church, um, one person said, I heard it through the grapevine. Peter's not a great preacher. Oh, man. That was painful. And, they, and this, they didn't just say that. They said, I don't know if that preaching could sustain this church. Oh, man. I heard it through the grapevine, but I'm telling you, it was painful to hear. I couldn't sleep for days. And I said to myself, what do I have to do to prove that person wrong? What do I have to do? I heard recently, a few uh, weeks ago, that through the grapevine again, because I hear it, man, not everyone loves me. I heard some people here in this church said some bad things about me. I don't know who. But if that was eight years ago, you know what i do? i do a little CSI investigation. <laughs> I sit down, I say, who are the people that are saying this about me? I sit down, I find out where your circle of friends are. I would start eliminating, process of elimination. I find out who this person is, and I wouldn't sleep until I did. I slept like a baby. Because I know that at the end, as long as I'm a child of God, and I do fail, I do, and I make mistakes. But as long as I try to do my best for God, that's all I can do. And in all honesty, guys, it's going to disappoint you. And I want to apologize ahead of time for that. Six years ago, I had to believe dying was better than living. I believed it with my heart. Because I was so overwhelmed. And I felt like I was nothing but a promise breaker. I said I would never lose my wife, and I would never lose her for the church, and I was doing it. I became somebody I didn't want to become. And I stand before you today, and I'm happier and at more peace with who I am than I've ever been. And I never would have dreamed in all the years of my life, growing up as a kid till now, that God would take my pain of abuse in the past and all of the mistakes that I've made as a pastor to be an opportunity for me to encourage you But tomorrow I get on a plane to go to Norway and I minister to 150 pastors. And they asked me to preach four times. And you know what I'm going to do all four sessions? I'm not going to do lessons on how do you grow a church. The all four things I'm going to talk to them about is how do you become emotionally healthy as a leader? So that when you're 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, that you'll still love what you're doing. But more importantly, you'll love the people that are closest to you the most. And have peace in your life. I would have never imagined in all my years that God would take something in my life. He's not, he can never change the factual events of my past. But he certainly has changed the way I feel about him. And all I've done over the last six years is nothing crazy. All I've done is that I've said, I am not going to try to make time for the Sabbath. I make time for the Sabbath. I take the daily offices twice a day. I stop and I pause to slow down the busyness of my life so that I can be in loving union with God. I have have two soulmates that I share my life with. They know the darkest areas to my humanity. I have some spiritual mentors that pour into me when I have questions about life and about ministry, and they're just wonderful resource for me. And then I've had to hire a counselor for the past six years because I just didn't know how to make sense of my past. 
I didn't know how to make sense of it in a way where it can help me to become a loving person. And so I'm proud of myself for doing that. But it's made me to be the person I am today. And I am just scratching the surface of becoming this emotionally mature adult. But will you join me today? And will you stop trying? And will you start training to become an emotionally mature adult? That's my hope and my prayer for you. And as you do, may you feel God's shalom in your life. Let's pray.